Hello, and welcome back to Crypto Sapiens. I am your host, Humpty Calderon. And today we are talking to Alex Salnikov, co-founder of Rarible. You know, we start by looking back at the early days of Rarible and their launch of the easy-to-mint NFT platform that allowed anyone to create them. As Alex says, during that time, you either had to be a developer or be vetted by the marketplace to be able to mint NFTs. So their focus from the beginning has been accessibility. And this idea of accessibility continues throughout their own development as we see them also developing a first-of-its-kind aggregated marketplace for Ethereum NFTs and more recently the launch of community marketplaces. The latter of which has really resonated with many different NFT communities and creators as we see them building their own NFT marketplaces powered by Rarible. As always, there's lots to cover here, so let's get started. Alex, why don't you start by giving us a brief introduction to who you are? How did you learn about crypto? What were some of the things you were doing before it? And really, what was that like um, thing that attracted you to come into this space? Um, that's a great question. I think I've always been attracted to crypto. That is... Uh, I was uh, my my early career and not even, not even career. I was in school. I was trying to earn money online, and I had hard times receiving that because oh, you need to have a passport to get in like a financial account somewhere. And I was I was struggling through all the services uh, like oh okay this one allows me to uh, create an account without the passport. I don't do not more than a hundred dollars on that and all that stuff. And then when I finally learned about crypto, that was very early in my life in second year of university, I was finally, this makes sense. Right. So this is what I was waiting for. I waited for the internet native money that don't restrict me on who I should be, uh, who don't ask me to do a legal proof that feels like cash. And I read a Bitcoin white paper. It was, okay, that's a digital cash, uh, cross-border, and doesn't doesn't depend on any institution. I was, wow, that that is great. And I'm an engineer by my background, and that was that felt ex- especially good that now we could just engineer the financial system rather than rely on on a, on a bank, on a, on some institutions that are run by people. So it was appealing to that part of my, my personality when something is just autonomous and created by engineers, by people like me, not by people like that wear suits. Uh, and I fell down the rabbit hole. Um, since then I'm in crypto. It was 2012. It was, it was 10 years ago. Cut. <sighs> That's incredible. I mean, So what I take away from what you've just shared is that the value you saw early on in 2012 is very early on, is that ability for payments for the work that you were doing. And that just seemed to open up a rabbit hole that you just fell into exploring uh, more of the space. Tell me a little bit about maybe some of the first things that you started doing in the space uh, in terms of development. Uh, with crypto? Um, early on, there was a massive problem that crypto was f- heavily disconnected from the real world. So the instant thing you can come up with is, okay, let's let's create a bridge. Let's uh, create on-ramp and off-ramp where you will be able to buy Bitcoin. There was nothing else back then. Or sell Bitcoin. So, okay, uh, I have this magic internet money, but in order to feel them as real, you need to have the way to just get them on your uh, on your hands in in a traditional form. So uh, we started building a, a bridge and on ramp and off ramp solution. Um, ran into all sorts of regulatory issues, of course, but it was interesting because back then it was even before the regulators knew that they are opposing it. They just didn't know what that is. And so we even found a bank that was allowing us to charge like credit cards and ex- change that to crypto because they thought, okay, it's just something. And and then later they learned that, oh, it's actually, we've got the letter from 
uh, from like our like higher institution that we should uh, abstain from these activities. So that was our like first rough uh, country, rough um, facing uh, the the regulatory world. So we decided just okay. Instead of on ramp and off ramp, we will we'll create an exchange that would be like mm-hmm. purely uh, crypto, just um, altcoins and trading for Bitcoin, um, matching engine, and we thought that all all the problems with existing exchanges that they are slow. And we went ahead to build extremely fast exchange, a million trades per second. Short sales, leverage, just options. Like we, we we let our engineering cards to to take on like whatever they wanted to do, and and there was a, close to zero liquidity using all that incredible software. <laughs> I think inspiration inspiration for Rarible was um, last crypto winter. There is a lot of things that are coming out of the post noise market. Um, and we thought that some of them work, some of them make sense. And what made sense is instead of just a, a wallet on your computer, you can now connect your wallet to a DAP. That was an important primitive that was very new. Oh, I can actually connect my Ethereum wallet to DAP and use it as my login system, as my identity, as my uh, as my account of consisting money. Mm-hmm. Mm, and all these uh, wallets that you can connect to the DAPs have this tab of collectibles. So, oh, I can I can actually have collectibles on my this virtual identity account. So, um, I can own items. I can own things with this identity. Mm-hmm. It, it it feels different than oh, I have just a, an account with Bitcoin because you can send money, but it's not extensible. And and it's like, okay, what, what can I own? It, it feels like there is something to it. It feels like there will be maybe another wave of adoption using using this part, this software. Um, so what what can we own? What can we own? What 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 is more like simple and fun than DeFi? DeFi is great. I love DeFi. Uh, I can do a compound loan or Aave loan on 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 my crypto holdings, but uh, it's it's extremely difficult for people to understand. And many of them are like I'm I'm fine with my loans, but something more lifestyle, something more casual, something more fun, something more yellow, like uh, our like that got represented in our branding. And and there was this NFT concept back then almost like non projects, couple of copies of crypto kitties. So I thought, okay, um, this NFTs it feel it feels something interesting into them because as soon as you get them on your identity, you can transfer that identity to another wallet and on this new wallet it's the same items, the same identity. So it feels like it's digital you who owns digital items. And if you buy a digital item, the shopping experience and the shopping um, feelings when you when you shop for things, you get excited when you buy stuff uh, that you own. It, it, the, the ownership of the emotion of ownership is is so uh, thrilling. Uh, we thought, okay, let's let's do something with NFTs and let's create a tool that would just allow you to create a new NFT because there was no many NFTs. So that's variable V0. Mm-hmm. And we, it was, okay, here's upload the picture, let it have a name, let it have a description, and let's connect wallet and just create it and let's mint it on your profile. And that was something fresh because back then you either needed to be a developer to create NFTs 
or you needed to be onboarded by one of these art platforms that were vetting people like, oh, if you're a real, if you're a real person, if you're a real creator, if you have following, there, there was this like gatekeeping. And that was very con contrarian to what we s saw in crypto before when it's, it's open, it's, it's, it should be for everyone. So we created a minting tool for everyone. That was, that was variable. Mm. We, we zero and we won was like, okay, well, let's now trade this. That's interesting. So I don't mean to interrupt. I, I just thought that was an interesting uh, way that you described uh, Rarible V0 uh, in terms of the landscape uh, at the time when you first developed it, uh, being something that was uh, restricted based on people's ability to be able to easily mint an NFT. And you connected that to creators, which I think is actually quite important. I think the NFT, you know, market is, uh, in my opinion, primarily, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, lifted up by creators who have, you know, this, uh, these, these, these assets, these, these uh, creative assets in the, you know, tangible in the real world, if you will, um, and they're trying to transition that into a di digital uh, landscape where they can provide some other connection to their fans, to their holders, um, including, like you said, some shared identity, for instance, or even maybe uh, individual identity if someone wishes to build out a digital identity using uh, NFTs. So I think that's really interesting. And I really uh, appreciate you having shared with us also that like V0 was a way of facilitating some of the ease of use uh, or participating uh, and removing some of those barriers using this minting tool. So I think you were going to start talking about yep. V2. Tell me then a little bit about what was that like the need for kind of an evolution maybe of what Rarible was uh, to create V2. Actually, the formal V2 of Rarible came out only this autumn, three years after. So there was, but there was a long road and big, a lot, big evolution happening towards that. Um, at first, it was a minting tool that was open for everyone, and then we created a, an a, like a governance token to decentralize this. That was a, a more or less the moment when we established ourselves as, as, as one of the market leaders, community uh, embraced this uh, product that gives some, some power to them, that gives some, uh, some rewards for them to trade on the marketplace, that established liquidity of the marketplace, a greatly expanded liquidity on the marketplace, and... Um, Established us as as the just the big player. There was a lot of improvements done. Oh, now you can upload videos. Now you can upload um, MP3s. Now you can do unlockable content. A lot of things around creation. Now you can do editions. Eleven fifty five, not only RC seven twenty one. Eleven fifty five. It's another standard that is allows you to have like five NFTs of the same uh, like. Almost as if each NFT would have a balance. Like there's a hundred NFTs and uh, uh, that are the same, and out of them, ten uh, belongs to one person and five belongs to another. Uh, so we grew into this giant marketplace and that generated like three hundred million dollar worth of sales in uh, 2021. Mm, and and that was right before the PFP trend starts to emerge. So that was the basically beginning of of the year um, of 2021. Crypto art was booming. Uh, every creator in the space created some NFTs. And then closer to the summer, the PFP trend started to arise. Okay, now there's crypto punks, there's board apes, cool cats, hash masks, all this. All these collections that now represent not not exactly art, they represent the community. Like oh, mm -hmm. all the coolest uh, OGs have a punk. All the coolest 
newcomers that got rich on Ethereum, they have a board ape now and it costs a hundred thousand dollars and you put it on the avatar and whenever you have a conversation on Twitter, people can attribute you some qualities like, oh, you've been early to crypto, you're quite uh, rich, you, you can afford to have this avatar, you were early into the trend, maybe you didn't buy it for a hundred thousand, but now it was a hundred thousand. Mm, you, th- this, this avatars, they have some like brand characteristics. Uh, board apes are bold, even a little aggressive. They, uh, they stand for their values and uh, doodles, they are cute. They are usually worn by creators, by product people, by design people, by CEO of Winklevoss, uh, of, of, of Gemini. So this, this became rather community than, than a, an art in itself, although art still was the way to express the values of the community. And um, when we faced with a, with a, with a challenge and uh, more or less like a difficulty that there is the crypto art segment of the market and there is a PFP segment of the market that are a little different. Uh, crypto art would need the uh, auctions and collaborations while PFP would need uh, filters and uh, mm, more like e-commerce experience. So, we, we, we see that distinction that different use cases require different UX of the, of the tools. And we created the product, which is called Variable Protocol, uh, which is essentially an infrastructure layer, like, oh, build your own product using our infrastructure, because it's, like, it's inevitable that the, the space will fractionalize and verticalize into different segments that requires slightly different UX and UI, like, oh, best for games, best for the main names, best for that, best for this. So this, this variable protocol uh, was, was another big push for us by the end of 2021. And the whole 2022, uh, we've been developing both infrastructure and this variable marketplace. And by the end of 2022, we created... Uh, a UI offering, you can now uh, use the generator and to create your own marketplace. The various brands use this. Uh, we launched like 13 marketplaces with brands um, on using the same decentralized infrastructure, Variable Protocol. And Variable Protocol became the aggregator. You can access all the items listed on Luxrare, on OpenSea, uh, through the same infrastructure. And this is surfaced through Rarible as well. So that was what was called Rarible V2. As you can see, it's a long road, but uh, if I would try to summarize it, the NFTs are different. And we created a, a, a developer offering that allows you to build something different for different categories. And Rarible is just like this Google of NFTs that you can go and search for anything from any marketplace. Uh, as just one of the uh, usage of this infrastructure of this tool, now, does it make sense at all? That's that's a little hard to unpack. You definitely covered a lot of ground here in terms of describing the journey from, you know, what Rarible was in its early state to what Rarible is in its latest update. You mentioned a couple of terms here, and I, yeah. I just want to go back because I yeah. think it's worth unpacking these a little bit more. And one of the things that you talk yeah. about is aggregation as an aggregated marketplace. The other thing that you were also talking about was yeah. Rarible as a protocol. I think those two things are, um, you know, quite interesting. And maybe let's start with the aggregation piece first, because I think the protocol one, for me at least, uh, allows us to have a conversation that looks at the ecosystem beyond NFTs, beyond NFT marketplaces. So let's look at these, this, com- this, this topic of like aggregated marketplaces. What is the value, first of all, of aggregating, uh, be- being an aggregated marketplace? Like what is it that the community gains? What is it that creators can gain? And, and you know, really to be able to understand why Rarible took on this challenge and delivered this new product experience. So imagine you you found an online community like Doodles or Port Apes or any other PFP community that you like. 
and you want to get into that community you want to become a rep uh, one of the of the members so you want to buy uh, an item they are quite expensive and you usually try to find an item that fits your personality but sometimes you just want the cheapest so imagine you want the cheapest one and you go to a marketplace and you can see there like you sort them by price and you can see that okay something costs like five ETH. And then you go to another marketplace and you see something costs four ETH. And you go to a third one and something costs like four point five. So you think okay maybe the second one was the best where it was for four ETH. So since the many different places started to offer trading of NFTs uh, you now need to go to multiple venues to check the prices and aggregated marketplaces, which now are many, uh, but it, it is the marketplace where you can see everything from every marketplace. You can see, you can just have a filter. Okay. What is the marketplace that it's sold, but you can sort them out in, in just one big feed and, and find the cheapest one across marketplaces or you can find something that represents you. And for example, it's listed only on one of them and it's not listed on any other. So you, you can see that all, all of them clearly in one place. So to say, like aggregator, aggregator, uh, like Google flights that aggregates tickets from all the a- airlines. No, I, I can see then the value um, to the creators, right? You have a much larger audience. Uh, you give collectors an opportunity to be able to look at these collections um, in terms of their cost across, you know, all these different marketplaces to find maybe the best, um, you know, entry point for them, for, for example. Um, that, that's really interesting. Uh, and you said now, of course, maybe at the time was an innovation. Now it's a little bit more uh, proliferated. But there are other uh, marketplaces that have potentially added this um, as a as as a way of providing that same service, right, to creators and collectors. So, I guess maybe even here, there's uh, a bit of a tangent that I want to fall into because we're talking about creators and collectors, and to me. Both of those are the groups of people that make up a community, right? And in terms of community, we saw earlier this year, there were um, community members from the creator site in particular that were upset, that were uh, rising and rising up and, and, and joining together and saying, we need exchanges to support um, royalties, because that is how most small projects, maybe not the larger projects that have built out a brand, have gotten VC funding or have other ways of like, uh, uh, you know, getting revenue. For the smaller brands, though, they were coming together and saying, this is not acceptable. Royalties are a very important piece of our ecosystem. What was uh, Rarible's stance then and what is Rarible's stance now in terms of that commentary about royalty. We, we always supported royalties and we continue to support royalties and we never turned off the royalty support. I, I, I believe this is all like a massive, just one massive gain theory problem because royalties cannot be enforced on chain. You can't say that marketplaces must and must have these royalties. There, there was an attempt by, uh, and quite successful attempt by OpenSea to create a special tool that creator can incorporate into their uh, collection that would say that marketplaces that don't support royalties, they can't trade this NFT. And that was what turned market backwards a little. So like 30 or 40% of new collections adopted that tool and they said, okay, this NFTs can be only traded on marketplaces that do support royalty. And this, uh, after that series of announcements from like this marketplaces that don't support royalties came like, Oh, we, we starting to turn the support for royalties back a little, maybe not full royalties, maybe partial royalties. Uh, but that, that was turned the market a little backward. Interesting. 
So, you know, as a as a marketplace for NFT creators, it sounds like at least uh, for you and, 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 and Rarible specifically, this idea of like uh, royalties and, and, and creators kind of uh, being able to collect on that is something that that you agree on. It, it, I thought it was really interesting, though, that you mentioned how um, I think you said something about game theory. Tell me a little bit about at least your personal thoughts of how maybe creators and maybe even through Rarible creators can um, find better ways of monetizing their brands. Do you have an opinion? Does Rarible have tools to be able to provide kind of a richer experience for the creators? That yes, we started as the platform where you can create NFTs. And our latest offering is you can create your own marketplace. And this, is tool, this tool is used by creators that want to have brand safe experience that don't want to send people imagine you created an NFT collection and then you, you say, okay, now go there and trade this NFTs on these marketplaces. So you're lo- losing your customer well, to uh, an external website where you don't control the flow. They might don't come back to you and you don't know if they even did something. You can't send them an email saying, oh, there is a new drop. Uh, there might be an, a fake so that's why it, it's some it's it's a comparison of having your own marketplace versus being an Amazon seller. So many many uh, prominent brands mm-hmm. choose to build their own direct to consumer uh, marketplaces where you you interact with your consumer, and uh, this is one of the tools that Rarible provides. So Rarible is in essence all all sweet for creators to come there, create their first NFT absolutely for free without any friction, uh, without paying gas price using lazy minting. The buyer would pay the gas price for creating that NFT. Uh, Make the next step and create your own collection uh, with the series of NFTs. And that will be only your your own smart contract. And the third step to create your own marketplace uh, that will be your own marketplace um, with only your own assets. It, it's taking the ownership back to creator in, in various forms of its existence. So I think that's that's incredible. Uh, I think that that is such a, a valuable resource to give creators I can imagine, and look, uh, I'm not making any announcements here that Crypto Sapiens is uh, going to be launching an NFT series, but I can imagine that if Crypto Sapiens was interested in designing and releasing a series of uh, NFTs for its community of you know guests, for its community of uh, listeners or whatever, there would be value for us as a organization to come together and say. For anyone who's interested in supporting the project, uh, supporting us through NFT sales, come to our marketplace because we can create a unique experience for our uh, collectors, for instance, so that they may have a more comprehensive, you know, uh, educational experience if that's kind of why they're there or some sort of entertainment feature, whatever. But there is something to be said about giving creators the ability to not just mint these NFTs, but also the entire uh, user journey, if you will, from minting to everything else that comes after that, even if it's a secondary market, for instance. So I think that's really that's really cool. And um, so why don't you explain to me how that works then uh, briefly, maybe not too technical, uh, technical. Um, is that powered by the Rarible protocol or is that separate from that? Spot on. It is rare, It is powered by Rarible protocol. And uh, earlier we touched this point of oh, what is a protocol. Uh, and protocol, it's a new kind of new Web3 concept. There were uh, protocols before. Um, HTTP is a protocol. If you are entering the website, your website talks to the user mm-hmm. through through like 
to the wire. And the protocol is, oh, how, what, is, what, what is the actual like, rules of that conversation? The user needs to introduce themselves uh, to the website. The website needs to uh, acknowledge that, oh, okay, we know you, we, we remember you, you came before, uh, here's your cookie. Uh, so that is the traditional meaning of protocol. Uh, we, we usually don't know about them because they're well hidden behind the UI, behind the screens. And in Web3, protocols are a little bit more powerful because not only they exchange information, but they also can exchange and hold value. A good example of a protocol is Uniswap. Uniswap, it's a decentralized exchange. Many of you know it, but... Uh, and on, uh, there is an app. You can go to the app.uniswap.org and you can exchange your crypto. But this app, it's the only front end, it's the only UI, and the power, true power sits on the protocol where you have massive amounts of tokens sitting and waiting ready for you to exchange them and multiple wallets for example metamask or coinbase wallet they're connected directly to this backend directly to this protocol to exchange that value and more than 50 percent more than half of the value exchanged on the uniswap comes not through the ui of uniswap app but comes from a every other app so this is the concept of the protocol it's separation between what you see and and what exists on the blockchain and what actually exchanges value. Why it is important? Because that means that two, two people, one of them is coming through the Uniswap interface and another is one coming through the MetaMask wallet. And one of them wants to buy and another one wants to sell. They would be matched behind the scenes with each other. And nevertheless, they came through different UIs. Mm -hmm. And the same way that Apple Mail can send an email to the Gmail uh, because there is an email protocol. So this is all a little technical, but the true reason why this is cool that this exists is because if you build your own marketplace on top of variable protocol, it's not that you need to build it from zero. It's not that the first person would come and they wouldn't see anything on sale and they would be the first who will sell something and then the second person will come. And there is this very complex cold start problem when, when you, you don't have enough liquidity for new people to see the, the value in your marketplace, but it is already connected to this giant pool of liquidity, of liquidity of variable, liquidity of other marketplaces that use variable protocol. It all lives this in, in this product behind the scenes in variable protocol, and you're building only UI and front end to that. This idea of building on a protocol, I think it's um, quite interesting. Uh, and I bring it up because I feel like one of the uh, domains, if you will, in which I've seen the protocol conversation uh, start to expand on it, maybe more familiar to some of our listeners uh, that maybe aren't so familiar in terms of like protocols on the DeFi level or even on the NFT marketplace level is that of like social platforms, right? I think many of us may be familiar with like Lens Protocol, for instance, right? Where they're building the underlying technology on which applications can build on top of that take advantage of everything from identity management to, um, you know, the, the, the social graph that's been created um, on Lens. These applications can create uh, experiences that are interesting to them, interesting to their communities on top of this foundation without having to rebuild uh, all the tooling and the different uh, connections to your point of like HTML earlier on the internet, there's a framework of protocols that allow for us to turn on our computer, open a browser, 
type in a domain name or an IP address if we have it, and then just go there. And the same thing like right now, we're recording this using a web app, and we're doing that because this company didn't have to build the underlying technology to be able to allow for you and me to come together and record this podcast together. It sounds like not just on the social level with, you know, uh, protocols like Lens, but also with Rarible, that's the service you're providing. You're building on building up that underlying foundational uh, technology for anyone, creator, collector, to build on top of that technology so that you're facilitating that uh, experience both for them as a developer, but also for their users. That is a fair summarization of what we do. Yes, and I'm I'm Lens Magsy now. <laughs> yeah, I, I I I a couple of weeks ago I onboarded and I, I have some some couple of viral tweets that was uh, really well accepted by the community, and I can have different apps. I can I can log into one of the apps and I can have all my account, all my followers, all my content, and if that app uh, does something. If that app bans me, right, as we saw on Twitter, I can use another app. That's the value prop of, of taking ownership, of having the value on the protocol layer and of having multiple front ends to that, to that protocol. Well, that's incredible. So, I mean, I feel like we really captured uh, a good snapshot of, about Rarible and kind of where it's at now as a community tool, as a marketplace first, obviously, but as a community tool for developing your own marketplaces. Um, and it just seems to me that from the very beginning, the ethos of Rarible was we are really here to facilitate anyone to participate into this ecosystem. And where that started maybe from simple minting tools and now to like a protocol in which people can build out their marketplaces, it's been consistent throughout. So that's that's really great to see and great to hear. As we wrap up here, well, first of all, did we miss anything? Is there anything else you wanted to add? I think we covered it well enough. Okay. So there's one last question that I ask all my guests, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. Because again, the people that we're talking to uh, through Crypto Sapiens are people who are in that journey, curious, uh, wanting to learn more, wanting to become more active um, users of Web3 tools and the ecosystem overall. So we love to hear from the people that come through Crypto Sapiens as our guests in terms of what was influential to you in your early crypto journey. It could be a person that uh, was super helpful to you personally. It could be someone that you saw on crypto Twitter. It could be a book that you read or it could be a white paper. Is there anything that was very influential to you early in your crypto journey? Bitcoin white paper and Ethereum white paper. Uh, and this might sound as a simple answer, but at some point I was curious to learn more. I went to different people and I was asking, what should I read? What, what can help me to advance? I didn't understand how smart contracts work and what are the limitations and what are the possibilities of the system. And uh, I failed to get enough of the answer, so I thought, okay, I'll just read default one. I'll, I'll read the theorem white paper. And thanks to Vitalik and his team and the Kevin Wood and other people, it is so well written. It, it explains all the philosophy and the concept in a, in a powerful way that it was great to read. Um, to build up on that, I was reading newsletters. There is Wicked Ethereum newsletter. There is Defi the Defiant newsletter uh, that I've been subscribed to. Uh, and they cover all the new things that come into the space. And that was very influential to me in, in the last bear market to just explain uh, expand, explore, uh, no, uh, to jump on this train of the identity connect your wallet early on. And uh, that was what effectively helped to build variable as it is. 
And that's a wrap. If you'd like to learn more about Alex and Rarible, you can find them on Twitter at Insider0x and Rarible, respectively. And please don't forget to give us a like, subscribe, follow, and a five-star review wherever you listen to this podcast. It really does help us get this content out to more people like you. And if you'd like to get more information like this one or other podcasts, you can go to our website at cryptosapiens.xyz. Until next time, stay brainy.